All right, Romans chapter 8, which many people regard to be the greatest chapter in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the title of this morning's message is the greatest chapter in the Bible. John Piper says, the greatest book in the world is the Bible. The greatest letter in that book is the book of Romans. The greatest chapter in that letter is Romans chapter 8. And I would add the greatest verse in chapter 8 is verse 1. Uh, matter of fact, I love what John Piper said. He said the Bible is the greatest book. Romans is the greatest letter. Chapter 8 of Romans is the greatest chapter. And chapter 8 verse 1 is the greatest verse. Charles Spurgeon used to say that for those in Christ, it would be unjust for God to ever punish you for sin. He could never punish you for sin because that would be requiring two payments for the same sin. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, it would be unjust to hold a believer responsible for sin because that would require two payments for the same sin. This declaration of no condemnation applies to both your past and your future sins. You see, many Christians get that Jesus paid the penalty for their past sins. This applies to our past. This applies to our failures and our sins. There, amazingly, there are people, though, who act like Jesus only paid for their past sins. Look, let me ask you a simple, logical question, right? When Jesus died on the cross, how many of your sins had you committed yet? Now, let me just ask you a question, just on a practical, logical note. How many sins did you commit when Jesus died on the cross? Jesus' death wiped out not only the presence of existing condemnation, he wiped out the possibility of future condemnation. And that means there is literally nothing that you could do right now that would make God love and accept you any more than he does, and nothing you could do that would make him love you any less. Jesus wiped out the present, the past, and the future condemnation that my sin brought upon me. Nothing you do will ever make God love you more, and nothing you do will ever make God love you less. You need to let that sink in for a minute, because when you do, that will free you from the performance trap. The Holy Spirit relieves us by the grace of God from a performance trap. What are you embarrassed of right now? What is there in your life that you would be mortified if somebody found out about it? What secret is there that you want something from your past or even a struggle in your present that you're like, I hope nobody ever knows about that. God has already seen it and God has already declared no condemnation. Jesus paid that for that in full. Expose something very embarrassing about your life. First of all, I'm gonna tell you something. God already knows that embarrassing thing, if it even exists. He already knows it. And his son has already paid for it. Let's <laughs> see, watch this. That then frees me from the pretending trap. The second thing is the Holy Spirit not only delivers from a performance trap, he delivers us from a pretending, a pretending trap. Joby Martin, a friend of mine, describes this kind of religious life like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. If you've ever tried to do that, you know, you gotta, gotta really concentrate because the beach ball is always trying to wriggle out and pop up. And it's like the guy standing in a pool on a beach ball. He doesn't want it to hit the surface. He doesn't want it to come up. He's acting like it's not there, but it takes all kinds of concentration, all kinds of work, and it's always trying to make itself to the surface. Chapter 8, verse 1, excuse me. Therefore, therefore, he says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Has there ever been a more powerful therefore in the entire history of the English language? Let's just read it again. There is therefore now. Has there ever been a greater therefore in the Bible? Now, real quick, don't let the word law there um, uh, throw you because this is not law in the Old Testament Mosaic law sense. You need to read that word law in this verse. Read that like the word principle. There is a new principle at work in me. We used to operate according to the old principle that if we kept the law good enough, we would be accepted. The problem we discovered was that the law couldn't change our hearts. Now, this word law, don't, don't think of the Ten Commandments. Think of the, the word principle. It's a principle. See, there's an old principle that you had to keep the law in order to be accepted. But we found out that even those who, who believed that with all their hearts were failing to do that. But now, Paul says, there's a new principle. There is a new law that is at work in my heart and life. And that new law, new principle, is the life-giving power of the Spirit. But there's a new principle, this scripture says, that the Holy Spirit gives us new life. How do I know that there is no condemnation for me? 
It is because I see the Spirit of God at work in me. You see, how can I know that I'm no longer under any kind of condemnation? The Spirit of God lives in you. Listen, friends, the necessary complement to forgiveness of sin is a release from the power of sin. You see, the Holy Spirit seals God's forgiveness at the same time he breaks the power of canceled sin. This was illustrated in the life of Jesus through the miracles where he would heal people. And sometimes in those miracles, he would say something honestly kind of strange. Somebody would be brought to him that was lame. They couldn't walk. And Jesus would say to them, your sins are forgiven. Now rise, take up your bed and walk. So when Jesus did miracles, there's an interesting note in some of the miracles he did. Jesus would oftentimes forgive a person's sins before he healed them. Now, this is interesting. Do you remember the four friends who brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus? Here's another example from the life of Jesus. It comes from John chapter 8. A woman is brought to Jesus who is caught in the very act of adultery, it says. In John chapter 8, though, there was a woman caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you comes before, go and sin no more. I've told you it's significant because most of us would want to reverse those. We would say something like, if you go and sin no more, then I will consider not condemning you. So why did Jesus put him in that order? Now listen to this. He said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. You see, there's this principle. Jesus changes the order of the way we think. And he says, I will first forgive you. Why does he do that in these stories? You see, the gospel message is not stop sinning. That would be an impossible message. The gospel message is behold the love and the acceptance of your God, and then you'll have the power to stop sinning. The gospel, friend, listen to me. If you're on radio, hear what I'm saying. If, wherever you're at in your living room, you're at home or at work, at the office, listen to what I'm saying. The Bible is not telling you stop sinning, then come to Christ. He says, come to Christ. And he said, I will help you stop sinning. So in verses one and two, Paul articulates the two kinds of freedom from sin that come from salvation. He says, by Jesus' death, he's freed us from the penalty of sin, but now through his spirit. There are two powers and they always go together. They're like a coin with two sides. Christ delivers you from the penalty of sin. He bore that on the cross for you but then he gives you his Holy Spirit. Because remember what I've told you, God is not just after obedience. He's after a whole new kind of obedience. He's after an obedience that grows out of desire. You see, God's not after your obedience, my friend. He's not after your money. God's after your heart. He loves you and he wants heart obedience. Notice by the way, it doesn't say setting your mind on the spirit. It says, setting your minds on the things of the Spirit. Now note that Paul doesn't say, fix your mind on the Holy Spirit. Notice that. He says, fix your mind on the things of the Holy Spirit. He's not a force, he's a person. This is a good time to say something very important. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a force. May the force be with you. The Holy Spirit is a person. And setting your mind on the things of the Spirit means thinking about the things that the Spirit thinks about. It means you love what the Spirit loves. It means you seek the things that the Spirit seeks. Because that's what you do when you're in fellowship with somebody, right? So he says, set your mind on him and the things that he thinks about, the things that he promotes, the things that he has come into this world to do, what he's come into your life to do. Uh, look for the things he loves. Look for the things that he seeks. And just as you would love another person that you fell in love with, Fall in love with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8. The Spirit loves the fame of Jesus and the spread of his message. You see, the mission of the Holy Spirit is very simple. His mission is to glorify Jesus. So when you think on, participate in something that grieves the Spirit. And if you do it enough, the Bible says we grieve him. What drives him out? The mindset of the flesh. So what grieves the heart of the Holy Spirit? It's a mindset upon the flesh. Hostility to God in Romans would be defined according to the five selves. I don't think I've given you this before. The five selves. Let me, let me give you five selves. Okay. Self-will. All right. I want to do what I want to do. The first one is self-will. Not God's will, my will. I, you know, I don't really care what God wants me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Here's the second characteristic. Self-glory. Secondly, there's self-glory. Um, self-gratification. Third is self-gratification. 
Then there is self-righteousness. Here's the fourth one, self-righteousness. And then the last one, self-sufficiency. And there's a fifth one, and it's self-sufficiency. And as you think like that, the Spirit surges in you. You see, when we think this way, the Holy Spirit begins to surge in our life. When he says in verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, it just means at the core of who they are, they're more loyal to themselves than they are to God. Friend, listen to me. There are those who walk in the flesh cannot please God. Why? Because our sin nature will always be loyal to us. But the Spirit of God leads us to always be loyal to Jesus. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now that word live, by the way, in Greek, uh, that word live, the Spirit of God lives in you, that means permanent. It means permanent resident, not like he just comes an occasional visitor. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That word dwells in the original language isn't talking about a guy who pops in for a few hours, spends the night and goes on. He's talking about someone who literally becomes a permanent resident in your heart. Now, there are some Christian traditions that teach that you get the Holy Spirit after you're saved in some kind of um, uh, second blessing, the baptism of the Spirit. There are people who teach that the Holy Spirit comes later. It's called the second blessing of the Spirit. That's how Paul describes it. First Corinthians 12, look at it. He's talking about salvation here. By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. First Corinthians 12, 13 says, for in one spirit, we were baptized into one body. So if you're a Christian, you got the Holy Spirit. And Paul would say that the amount of spiritual power from that point on that you were experiencing has nothing to do anymore with how much of the Holy Spirit you have. The question from that point on is how much of you, how much of your heart he has. Friend, if you have trusted Jesus Christ, you've got 100% of the Holy Spirit. The question isn't, do you have the Holy Spirit, believer? The question is, does he have you? The Christian life is fellowship with the Spirit. And listen, if some of you would embrace that, that would be a game changer. You see, fellowship with the Spirit is a game changer. The Christian life is not gradual self-improvement. Don't settle for self-improvement. Because you're probably used to evaluating sin based on how bad the effects are. You see, most of us evaluate our sin by the impact it has on others. The real damage of sin is not the effects. The real damage of sin is that it grieves the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit goes, so do his fruits of life and peace. If you really understood that, it would, watch this, it would start to make small areas of compromise in your life every bit as devastating as big ones. The worst grief caused by our sin, caused to the heart of the Holy Spirit of God. Small compromises are just as great to the Holy Spirit as great compromises. I'm trying to get back into church. Not trying to get back into church. That'll never save you. The surrender's not total. You're just looking at him like a suggestion giver. You know, when I took driver's ed, I was thinking about this the other day because my daughters are about this age where they're getting into this. And driver's ed, I, had, I, don't, I think they still do it, but the car that I took driver's ed in, had the guy sitting next to me had this big old brake. That's all he had. Do y'all have this? The big old brake coming out? And it meant that he could stop that car anytime he wanted. And in fact, he did it like after we'd been out about five minutes just to show me that he had it. So I wanted to turn and he just like slammed on that brake and like, you know, slam in there. And what he was showing me was, you think you're in control of this car. And I'm letting you drive, but I can stop this car anytime I want to. You don't need a list of suggestions from Pastor Ed. You need, to, you need new life from Jesus Christ. I took driver's ed in high school. That was a trip. I'll never forget the guy who was teaching me. I noticed he had a strange thing over... Just underneath the, the glove box, there was this brake. And, and when I first pulled out of the parking lot, he stomped on it to show me who really boss was. And, 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 and I'll never forget that. When you come to Christ, you didn't come, you basically turn over the brake. And you're like, because I would describe probably some of our spiritual lives that way. Is it Jesus is speaking to you? And you're like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's go over here. That sounds awesome. Oh, I'll do that. But every once in a while, you're like, nope. You push that brake in. And the car comes to a halt because you've never actually surrendered it to him. You've kept that brake right in place. To be surrendered to Jesus means you take the brake away. Many of us see our relationship to Christ that way. And I'm not talking about you're the student driver. You're the guy with the brake. And to come to Christ and to surrender to him means that you give him the steering wheel. But you need to uninstall that brake, dude. You need to stop slamming on it every time God starts moving in your life. 
but ultimately he had the veto power. He had not surrendered the car to me. Until you surrender your break to the Holy Spirit of God, friend, you're vetoing God. Who do you think you are? Here's number three, third implication. I've got hope even when I feel dead. Here's the final application. I have hope because of the Holy Spirit of God. I have hope even in hopeless times.